Hi, everyone. I'm seeing lots of uh, folks from all over the place. Uh, got someone from Michigan, a couple people from Austin. I'm in Austin, Texas as well. So nice to see that. Uh, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, New York, California, Ohio, Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, welcome, everyone. OK, so um, I'm Adrian Hodge, and I'm your instructor. And if you are just joining us, this is the fourth class in this very long uh, drawing series that started a few weeks ago and will be running on Wednesday evenings for the next year or so uh, with some occasional Sundays and uh, Thursday evenings as well. Um, and so think of this as a drawing, a year long drawing class that you have joined and uh, we'll be building on skills for absolute beginners. There'll be a few classes sprinkled in for uh, more intermediate and advanced students. And I am a uh, teaching artist based in Austin, Texas. Uh, my professional art is based on uh, dream states, quantum physics, vintage photography. I was just talking with Jimena, our lovely moderator before the class about all the, the concepts in my more uh, my professional work that I, I make and sell and that sort of thing. But I, I've been a teacher for over 10 years. I've taught middle school, I've taught high school, and I've taught adults for the past eight years or so. Um, so I wish I could get to know everyone in the class more individually, uh, like I do in my, my in-person classes, but we're a little more informal here since there's so, so many of you. But um, I'm going to let Jimena kind of operate the chat for the most part. And if there are a lot of questions that are reoccurring, then she will interrupt me and uh, let me know what those are. So please let me know if you have any burning questions or any comments or anything like that. But if you feel like you're behind or um, a little confused or there's a concept that I'm talking about that I didn't explain, it's probably in one of the previous classes. And uh, this is part two of a little mini series, I guess, about just the hatching, um, I'm sorry, the shading techniques. So last week we talked about two shading techniques and this week, we're going to talk about two more shading techniques. And I'll refer back to things from those other classes. Jimena is dropping the links to the previous classes in the chat right now. Um, so there's part one, which is this class is part two of. Uh, she just put that in there. And they're all available on YouTube. If you just search Artist Loft 101, they should come up pretty quick. They're also cataloged on the Michaels website. So, um, and then before I get started, um, I just wanted to mention some things that I have coming up that's not related to Michael's. Um, like I said, I'm a, a teaching artist and I teach my own independent classes online uh, through Zoom. And I also teach through the Doherty Art Center here uh, in Austin. And I've got a couple of virtual classes coming up with them. So um, Jimena is going to drop my uh, link tree link in the, the chat and that is where you can find uh, registration links for all of that stuff. So if you're interested, I've got um, two classes with the Doherty Art Center online classes. One is intuitive collage, and the other one is called nostalgia for now. And it's basically a watercolor still life class where we'll be um, focusing on a still life item that, uh, it has a lot of meaning for you in your life. So she just dropped my link tree link there in the chat um, where you can find the registration. It'll say register for Doherty Art Center classes for those two. And then uh, two independent classes that I have coming up. One is called Mindfulness with Ink, and that's a three hour workshop. And the other one is Drawing and Painting Clouds because a lot of my work is based on clouds. I've got a lot of clouds in my work. so consider myself a expert on drawing and painting clouds. So I've got that. And then um, the mindfulness with ink class is sort of a meditative class on using ink in a way to, uh, to meditate or as a meditative practice because it is so permanent. So it makes it really good. It's a good metaphor for 
meditation and I'll explain all that if you take the workshop or if you want to check it out um, more about that. It's um, the link to sign up for my independent classes is also there. Uh, the more the further Michael's classes should be posted on their upcoming classes um, list pretty soon. Uh, the next one that I have planned is uh, I think this Sunday, the 15th, and then um, every Wednesday and there's a few more Sundays coming up and uh, Thursdays as well. So yeah, plenty of Michael's classes coming up. If you don't see the next one there, just check back on upcoming classes on the Michael's website and they, they should all be there in the same place that you found this one. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with what we're talking about today. Uh, and like Jimena said, tag your work um, that you do from tonight or from any of the previous classes that are cataloged on YouTube and Michael's website. You can tag those with Make It With Michael's or Michael's classes or both on Instagram. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's I'm Adrian Hodge Art. And there's my other stuff, Facebook, email, website, but all of that should is on my can be found through that link tree link as well. And there's a few some of my cloud painting to impress you guys. Okay, uh, so moving on, we'll get started with what we have on the agenda this evening. Um, if anybody was having issues with smudging their work in the previous classes, you might wanna grab a piece of paper. That's one thing that's not on the supply list, but worth mentioning, if, especially if you're left-handed and you're smudging um, as you go. We're going to be using the Artist Loft sketching pencils. I've got the 12 set, and that's what was on the, the supply list for the class. And then a synthetic eraser and sketching paper. And that's all you need for tonight. And then, yeah, if you wanted to grab a blank piece of paper, copy paper, pull a piece out of your sketchbook for the uh, you know, so you don't smudge your, your drawing, that would be good. So last week we talked about two alternative shading techniques in part one, and that's hatching and cross hatching. So we're not gonna be talking too much more about those this week because we talked about them last week in part one. Um, but hatching is parallel lines that follow the contours of a form and just for people who have been uh, following along so far, who can tell me what a contour line is? Anyone? Contour line, what's contour line? Oh, let's see, it follows the item. Okay, yeah, it follows, follows what on the item? Outlines the object. Okay, so it's the outlines. Sometimes when we say outlines, people tend to think only of the silhouette or the outer line of a form. So, uh, and yes, it is the, the continuous outline of the object, but when we say outline, people tend to think, yeah, the, just the outer lines. But I want you to think about all of the surfaces of a form. So um, in the very first class, Introduction to Graphite and Drawing Forms, we practiced uh, contour lines like this that follow all of the, the outlines or all of the, the surfaces of a form. So we kind of drew this grid or elevational lines on a still life item and we uh, used organic items. And then in the next class, we talked about tonal shading and that is the most basic value technique value being light and dark uh, on a form and we so we covered everything to do with tonal shading in that that second class and tonal shading is smooth continuous blend that also follows the contours of a form so still thinking about contours as we're adding that value the light and dark tonal shading and we're doing it smooth and continuous uh, when we're doing tonal and then hatching and cross hatching are just another way of shading. It's another technique that you can do with a variety of um, materials. 
and you're adding one directional or parallel lines that follow the contours of a form. And then cross hatching is multiple directional lines. So you're following the contours of the form, but you're applying value light and dark in a way that um, goes multiple different directions. So not just one direction of parallel lines, but the lines can crisscross, they can be uh, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, et cetera, and they, they crisscross over each other. So that was where, where we left off last week in part one of these alternative shading techniques and uh, tonal shading got its own class. So now we're talking about uh, another couple of alternative shading techniques. So tonight we're gonna to be covering stippling, which is these little dots that repeat within the value or within the light and dark shapes that we see on a form. It's also gonna follow the contours of a form, but we're applying that value uh, not with smooth continuous lines, not with one directional hatching lines or cross uh, hatching lines, we're using one dot at a time. So it, it's very tedious, takes a lot of patience. And then we'll take a mental break from that and do some the scribbling technique, which uh, can be done very fast and loose and um, is a good companion to the stippling, which takes a lot of patience and, um, and time. So uh, the scribbling technique is just like it sounds, it's scribbles or even random marks and they have to follow the, uh, as you're applying that, you're also following the contours of the form and you're applying the light and dark as you're seeing it on the form. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put that aside and start out with uh, a value scale like we've done so far. We did that with tonal shading. We did it with hatching and cross hatching last week. So now we're gonna do a couple of value scales in regards to uh, stippling and scribbling. So grab any pencil. I'm going to use a darker pencil. I'm using a 6B and I'm going to draw two long skinny rectangles. This is just our practice. We're just becoming acquainted with stippling and scribbling. So if that little review seemed sort of quick, this is where we're slowing it down and uh, talking about what these how we do these shading techniques. So we've got stippling, we've got scribbling. When I talk about value, I often talk about a scale from zero to 10. So last week I, I did this and the week before that with tonal shading as well, we labeled our value scales zero to 10. And if you wanna put a five in the middle, you can. You don't have to have exactly 10 separate values on your value scale. Uh, really all I want you to do is just get a sense for the, the shifting or the fading from light to dark and how you would apply the shading technique um, in light to dark across the scale. So our 10 on our value scale is our absolute black. Our absolute darkest values. We don't want any paper showing through uh, at the 10 on our value scale. And then on our zero, we're going to leave it blank, or that's where it would be our absolute white. So, well, Adrian, could we use charcoal for this? Yeah, definitely. You could use charcoal, you could use a pen, you could even use all point pen if you wanted to. That's the wonderful thing about these alternative shading techniques is that you can do them with a variety of materials. We're just sticking with graphite here at the beginning of uh, these drawing classes, but you can do hatching, cross hatching, stippling, and scribbling with, yeah, pen, charcoal. You could do it with paint and a paintbrush if you wanted to. Um, tonal shading is, that's why it's the standard um, it's not one of these alternative shading techniques. It can only be done with graphite or charcoal. You can't really achieve that smooth continuous blend with a pen. Um, and last week we, we also talked about in part one of this how you've probably seen these alternative shading techniques 
in uh, engravings or any type of printmaking because in those processes you have to use a a sharp tool that you're uh, making you know indentions into the surface of either a wood block or a copper plate etc in printmaking and so it has to be done one mark at a time um, so I mentioned having the the set of 12 graphite pencils because they can really help achieve this value scale from light to dark if you're having issues with um, you know fading your your light to dark you will just use your darker pencils which are your your B pencils that have higher numbers on them so in the this 12 set the 6b is going to be your darkest pencil and on your h side the uh highest number h pencil i believe it's a 5h is going to be your lightest pencil so you'll start with your darkest b pencil and work your way to your lightest h pencils and if you're confused about the graphite pencils go back and check out that very first class i referenced and Jimena dropped in the chat, it was called Introduction to Graphite and Drawing Forms, and you can find um, that on YouTube and the Michaels website, and it has tons of information about just the basics of those drawing pencils. So I'm going to skip over that because I don't want to repeat too much stuff from those previous classes. It looks like she just dropped it in the chat again. I said I wasn't going to look at the chat, and then I keep looking. I'm going to just <laughs> close it for myself. Um, okay, so. I'm starting with my 6B on the darker side, and uh, we're doing these one dot at a time. So one thing that stippling is not is, you know, you can't, it can't be done with impatience. If you get impatient and you start like trying to like do it really fast, you might end up with these little uh, slash marks on the paper that definitely don't look as nice as when we apply them one focused dot at a time. So like I said, it's going to take a lot of patience to build this up to an absolute black, but we want to overlap our dots and just keep applying dots until we get them to an absolute black on our value scale. So that's our 10 on the value scale is just these little singular dots. So this is definitely one of the easiest ways to apply value for a beginner when you're first learning how to draw. And that is because it's really hard to make a huge mistake if you're only doing one dot at a time, especially if you really slow down and do one dot at a time. But, uh, you know, you can speed it up a little bit but you just don't want to go so fast that you end up with those slash marks. So it definitely takes a lot of time to overlap them to the point that no paper is showing through. And I realize I'm blocking it with my left handedness there and we try to move my hand. Also in the very first class, I talked about holding your pencil uh, towards the back of the pencil to relieve your pressure. When it comes to stippling, uh, you're kind of applying some pretty hard pressure um, just to get those dots to show up nice and dark. So the softer the pencil that you're using and the, the darker the pencil that you're using, the easier it's going to be to achieve, you know, dark dots. But if you, um, you know, want to be mindful of your pressure, just keep overlapping them. They will eventually become dark enough that they're overlapping and filling up all of the space in your on your value scale for your absolute black. Okay, so I'm going to kind of zip it along here and go ahead and go to my medium. This is the way I've been doing all of the value scales up until now. If you've been following along as I like to do my medium value scale or my medium value and then meet myself in the middle so that if this is my medium gray, so they're evenly spaced out. Dots, they're not overlapping too much. They're very evenly spaced. And then I'll just keep 
applying my dots until I meet myself halfway in between absolute dark and medium. And again, if you're having trouble with the pressure on your pencil, if your medium is looking a little too dark, like you were pressing down too hard, then you can just shift to your lighter pencils as you go. So uh, you could shift to a 4B. Hang on. Shift to a 5B for your, your medium dark on the value scale. So not quite absolute black, but overlapping almost to that point with a little bit of light coming through from the page. And then shift to a 4B, et cetera. And then a 2B would be a little lighter than that. And a B would be even lighter than that. This is gonna take some time. We're already 23 minutes in here to the class. So I'm gonna use my joke that I repeat every time I teach a stippling value scale. And that's if you're having trouble sleeping later, then you can finish this value scale because it will definitely take some time to get that, that value scale completely filled up. But I'm gonna to switch to my H pencils for my lighter values on this. So we need to meet somewhere in between absolute black and medium here in the middle. So you'll just fade that. And then for the, the lighter values, you're spacing those out even more and you're using your lighter H pencils. So it might get hard to see those, but you know that, that they're there and you're using lighter and lighter pressure as you go and then leave that zero blank just so that you can keep in mind that there's always gonna be an absolute white highlight. And just to go back to my stippling example here, when we apply those to an object, which we're gonna do in just a moment with the still life items that were on the supply list, you can see how in the absolute dark, I'm overlapping those. And this can get pretty mindless. I mean, that's one of the things that I love about stippling is you can sit in front of the TV and just fill in, you know, areas that need to be that dark, just keep, you know, steadily filling those in. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the, the scribbling uh, value scale, unless there are any questions about stippling before I move on. And I'll obviously come back to stippling with the still life object, but any questions? Yeah, we have a question about um, both stippling and scribbling. So what objects would you use each one of them for? Um, uh, let me get to that in just a minute when I move on to the, the still life object. Perfect. Okay, but any questions about just applying the, the stippling to a value scale? Um, I haven't seen any. Okay, anybody has any questions? Now is the time. All right. Um, well, then I'll go ahead and move on to scribbling and come back to that if there's a question about it. Uh, so scribbling is very much the opposite of stippling in that it is very fast and loose in comparison. So it's exactly like I said, it is a scribble or a random mark. So it doesn't have to be this little loopy scribble. You could maybe do squares that overlap over and over again. Uh, mine are kind of like figure eights, I guess, my little loops, but you could make them very uh, distinct figure eights. You could do, um, a, you know, a mark like a, a letter. You could do like the letter E over and over again. I mean, it can literally be anything. So it's scribbling or random mark. So uh, I'm using my 6B and I'm gonna just start scribbling here and I'm gonna overlap that until I get to my absolute black. And so the point of using these alternative shading techniques is that even though in the end you may end up with something that looks like tonal shading when you're done, like when I look closely at some of these examples, there's definitely a part, especially with the scribbling, because you know that little smooth continuous thing that we do with tonal shading can often be done with little circles that you just overlap. So you know the scribbling can very easily resemble tonal shading when you're done. 
but in the lighter values is where you really start to see that, um, you know, the application of that mark, either, you know, hatching, cross hatching, stippling or scribbling. And it just adds a certain character or quality to your work. You can combine these, you can do, you know, all four of them in, in one drawing. Um, there's no rules as far as how, how you use these shading techniques. They are just tools in your tool belt. So I'm lifting up on my pressure as I go down this uh, value scale and I'm just still using my 6B, but if you're having trouble with the pressure that you're putting on your pencil, again, shift to your uh, 4B and then your 2B, et cetera, as you, you get lighter on your value scale and then shift to your H pencils for your, your lighter version of your scribbling. And it doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to have exactly 10 separate values represented. We just want to show that we have an understanding of how to blend and shift these value scales from light to dark and how to transition them because blending them from light to dark is probably the, the trickiest thing as you guys who joined me last week with hatching and cross hatching probably noticed like as you're applying your, your dark and then you apply your lighter version of those shading techniques, they can feel like they have a separation between them, like how I've got a clear separation right now between the dark and medium dark. But if I just keep going over that until that transition feels like it's slowly fading, then it starts to feel like a smoother transition. So even though, you know, it seems like it's gonna be tricky to blend these like tonal shading, I think they are actually easier to blend than tonal shading because you can kind of easily hide, you know, your struggles within these, these marks that you're making. So, you know, and if you wanna use like even your H pencils into the, the darker side of your, your value scale so that it's even smoother of a transition, you can do that. And if it got too dark on the way down, you can erase it out or, or do it again. All right, any questions before we move on from? Uh... Yes, um, so about the stippling, um, how large do the dots have to be or does it kind of depend on the project? Um, yeah, there's no rule about how large the, the dots have to be. Um, definitely, if you're, you know, trying to cover like a really large piece of paper um, with stippling and, you know, you had like some large markers or something, you could do it with, you know, a thicker tip, felt tip pen or chart, you know, a nice thick piece of charcoal or something would definitely help achieve filling up a larger area faster. But if we're just using our graphite pencils for small still life objects like today, um, you know, just whatever size comes out of your pencil when you make a dot. It's more Perfect. about the way you're overlapping them and the way or spacing them out. So for your lighter values, you're spacing them out. For your darker values, they're overlapping. And uh, the pressure that you put on them will also affect how dark they appear. Perfect. So we have several several people asking about the long um, sharpened lead that you use. Okay. Um, yeah. So in the uh, second class that I taught um, a few weeks ago on tonal shading with and without a ground, I talked about sharpening your pencils with a blade. And uh, the advantage of doing that is that it reveals a larger amount of the graphite as you're drawing. So for that particular class, we were able to use it on the side to create a ground. And it looks like Jimena just dropped that link in the, the chat. And like I said, if you just search YouTube Artist Loft 101, this entire year long drawing class is called Artist Loft 101. There's a painting uh, teacher doing the painting classes and I'm your drawing instructor. So if you continue to come to the classes, uh, we'll you know, probably be dropping those links less and less because there's gonna be more of them. Um, but right now we're just in the fourth class um, 
and this is, you know, a little two part mini series on alternative shading techniques, but the, the second class in drawing artist loft 101 was on tonal shading and I talked about how to sharpen your pencil with the blade and get it like that. And when you do that, you can get just a lot of different varieties of lines. So it definitely can help with any shading technique, but with stippling, it can, um, well, for one, you just don't have to sharpen your pencil as often, but yeah, with stippling, you really do want those dots to be nice and concentrated and to a fine point. Um, unless you were trying to, you know, fill up a big dark area, then it's probably good if your pencil gets a little less sharp and it's more blunt, then it'll make larger dots, right, to fill up uh, a larger area. I didn't put the um, sanding block on the supply list for today, but in the tonal shading class I did, and when I sharpened the pencil with the blade, then I used the sanding sandpaper to get it to a fine point. So I just rub it on the sandpaper. And you can do this even, you know, without having sharpened it like that. And you can get um, a nice fine point to it. Okay, um, I don't want to take too much more time on the shading techniques because I want to apply them to a couple of still life objects. So I'm going to move on to a fresh sheet of paper. And I asked on the supply list for everyone to get a couple of organic still life items and I recommended small items like uh, flowers or leaves. Um, a piece of fruit would be fine, but just since I've got limited time and I want to uh, make sure I've illustrated both of these shading techniques, I'm going to use two really small um, still life items. So I've got a dried orchid flower and a, a leaf here. Um, okay, so this is where I mentioned like which shading technique would you use for which subject, right? When you're trying to decide like which one of your still life items to do the stippling with. I would pick, you know, look at the object and see does it have a lot of little, um, does, it, does it have a texture that maybe looks like it would be easy to achieve with dots. So this kind of has a little bit of a grain in the, the petal where it feels like, yeah, that would be easy to achieve using dots. Although this one has actual dots on it. So either one really, but I felt like that one was better for scribbling for whatever reason. Um, if you're an absolute beginner, I probably wouldn't choose a still life item that is very overwhelming and large and complicated for stippling. I would choose your smallest like, you know, a leaf would be perfect, or um, maybe you just, you know, pop a petal off of a flower and don't do the entire flower because it can, and you're going to find out very quickly if you have the patience for stippling or if you're a little more impatient. When I first started drawing in my early 20s, when I really learned the, the drawing skills that I, I still use today, um, I loved stippling. It was my favorite thing to do because, like I said, I could just sit in front of the TV for hours and just fill in um, with these stippling dots. And it was incredible how realistic I could get a, su a subject to be when I took my time with it. And I felt like it was very forgiving because it was just uh, one dot at a time. But now in my, you know, life as a professional artist and teacher and all the things that I do, I definitely get a little more impatient with stippling than I used to. And so I prefer to use some of these other shading techniques more. Um, and I don't really use stippling in my personal work all that much. Okay, so I'm going to zip it along here and go ahead and sketch this um, item. One thing I wanted to make sure to reiterate um, is about value shapes. So we've talked about this a little bit in all of the classes that have talked about value so far, which is all of the classes so far. Um, and that is the shapes of the shadows and shapes of the light that make up any um, three-dimensional form or really anything, any shape. Anything is going to have light on it because we see the world based on the light that's falling on it. But Anyone who's ever taken a class with me probably gets sick of me saying the words value shapes by the end of the class, or they love it because it, it starts to make sense to them. But it's all about these, 
irregular shapes of light and irregular shapes of dark that show up um, in a form. And so I talked about this in that very first class on drawing forms as we were sketching the elevational contour lines on that still life item, I said, look for these little, you know, shapes of shadows that are happening or shapes of highlights because people tend to focus on the shadows, but the shapes of the light are just as important as the, the shapes of the shadows. And then last week, um, I had a little moment where I talked about this when we were sketching one particular shadow, I stopped the class and I'm going to do it right now again and say, what does this particular shape of this shadow look like? Like make your mind a complete blank and just look at that, that shape, like the shape that's being cast on the paper by the orchid. I drew it right here to look like this. Like what does that look like to you other than the shadow of an orchid? I would say like a castle maybe kind of has the shape of like a castle. Um, what, somebody said a sharp tooth, cool. Anything else? A hat, I like it. Okay, so an upside down cotton candy, a cat, a bunny rabbit, I love it. Okay, so do that with these irregular shapes of light and shapes of shadow. Let's do it with a shape of a highlight. So not to give the shadows too much um, attention. What does this shape of light look like to you? I'm outlining it with my pencil right now. It's a shape of a highlight and I see it, it goes like this. What does that look like? Uh, I, mean, I think you guys are maybe still telling me about the other shadow. What does this shape of a highlight look like? Maybe I'm seeing like maybe a a boomerang, even though I think that's what I said last week, a wave, good. Um, maybe like a stick, because it's kind of long and skinny, like a branch, like it kind of does this. I'm emphasizing it. Um, a finger, okay, cool. So as you're looking at the different shapes, so I want you to block in all your shapes of shadows and your shapes of light. So rather than looking for those cross contour lines or elevational lines, we're following those contours as we apply the value shape. So if the petal curves that direction, you wanna make sure that as you're applying your value that it curves. But if you just look at those value shapes, you're gonna end up drawing something that's curved right there anyway, because you know your little uh, finger curved or the shape of the tooth had a you know curve or whatever to it so that is a, a trick that i'm not sure who taught that to me um early on in my drawing practice but it's something that I, I try to instill in all of my students and once they catch on uh it's really it's really groundbreaking and beneficial and it it's kind of everything and I will come back to it. It's not the last time I will talk to it, talk about that point in this, this long drawing class when we talk about, especially drawing the human face um, down the line, I will bring that up again and I will have plenty more tips and tricks for finding and seeing those value shapes. So, but now that I've kind of blocked in all of those light and dark value shapes on my form, I'm gonna start filling them in with my stippling dots. So I'm using my 2B pencil here, which is a pretty standard pencil to start with. And I'm gonna fill in my medium values first. And so I'm just looking at that shape of that shadow or that shape of that light. And I'm filling it in now accordingly with whatever value on the value scale of stippling I feel like it needs. So if it's a, a medium, then I'm spacing out my, my dots evenly and applying an even pressure. If it's a really dark shadow, like there's really only one spot on, on this. I definitely chose the orchid on, person, on purpose because it's so pale um, so that I wouldn't I could render it pretty quickly without running out of time. There's only one spot on it right here where it's um, really dark and that's on the, the inside of the, 
the dried orchid. So I'll overlap my dots until I get to a pretty dark there. And then on the stem, it also gets pretty dark. And that contrast, that sharp contrast from absolute dark to absolute light really makes things pop. So last week at the end of the class, a bunch of people held up their uh, example drawings and the ones that I felt like uh, really stood out were the ones that had a lot of absolute light and absolute dark happening. So feel free to exaggerate the light and dark that you're seeing on your, your object. And we're sticking to organic forms. We're not talking about anything geometric yet for a while until we get to linear perspective, which will be uh, towards the end of August. The last class in August is set to be my first class on linear perspective, and then I'll be covering linear perspective pretty much all through September and even into October. The classes that I have planned are uh, be a lot of classes on linear perspective. So that's where you've got any geometric form. But when we're just using flower petals and leaves, we don't really have to worry about perspective too much because like I said last week, it doesn't have to look like that leaf or it doesn't have to look like that flower. It just has to look like a leaf. If you take my drawing and painting clouds workshop, I'll repeat that again about clouds because when you're talking about something that's so purely organic like that, um, you know, as long as you've captured the essence of what a leaf looks like, I doubt you're going to be visited by, you know, anyone who's going to say, well, you know, your leaf doesn't have that exact shape or your, your dried flower petal kind of looked more like a, a shark's tooth, not a baby's tooth or whatever. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to fill in this, the shark's tooth shadow here with a value that matches the shadow that I'm seeing there, which isn't super dark. So if I just evenly space my dots, I think I can fill that in pretty quickly. So even though I'm trying to go quick because of our, I don't want to run out of time before so that I can move on to the scribbling uh, still life example, I'm still not banging and slashing on the paper. So there's a way to fill this in quickly without impatiently. Um, although you might like how it looks if you go really quickly, maybe you like a loose application of stippling. Honestly, I'm used to teaching stippling in my pen and ink class, and I always emphasize not to stab uh, when you're doing it with a pen too much because you'll ruin the nib of your pen. But with a pencil, I mean, you might, you might break your pencil. So that would, yeah, you don't want to do that. But you can sharpen it. It's not the end of the pencil if you sharpen it. If you stab your, you know, nice little felt nib pen too much, then you've kind of trashed your pen, so. Treat your supplies with dignity and respect. They'll be good to you if you're good to them. That's all my public school teaching coming out. I'm like, everybody take good care of the supplies. But these are actually your supplies, so why not take care of them? There's really no reason not to. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. I would say maybe just where I'm seeing my little line there at the edge, I want to ease that transition. So this is where the blending comes in as if you're trying to make a shift happen from dark to light or if you're seeing like the line at the edge of your shadow and you don't want to see it like I did just keep concentrating your dots to that moment of transition. Any questions at this point? Um, not really. I think the upcoming classes, I just saw that in the chat, I think they should be listing them soon, hopefully pretty soon, because yeah, there's one planned for this Sunday. Um, so it should, it should be there. Just keep 
checking back. Also, if you follow me on Instagram, I've been putting the link to the upcoming class to register in my my link tree. So if you follow that link tree link or bookmark it for all of my stuff, um, I'll make sure and update the link. Like if you click on it now, it would take you to this class registration. But as soon as I see the other one is listed, I'll, I'll update that. So um, Jenny would like to know, uh, do you mean if you draw a value shape, you will have drawn the object without thinking about the whole object and struggling to draw it? Is that what you mean by that? Yes. Um, and the more you can kind of disconnect from your idealized expectation of what you think, you know, lines and shapes and forms should look like and just purely draw what you're seeing, what you're observing on that object, the more satisfied you're, you're likely to be because we tend to have symbols in our minds for what we think a flower looks like or a leaf looks like or, you know, really anything. Um, we've got these kind of stock images in our brains. And if we're not looking at that object, if then we're drawing from our imagination and our memory of what, you know, an, a dried orchid looks like is not going to be as informative as the dried orchid itself. So if you can disconnect from your idea of what it looks like and just observe it and deconstruct it down to like, what does that shape look like? What you're probably going to draw it more accurately than you would if you're, you know, trying to draw the orchid shape. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to move on to the, the scribbling one, the scribbling example. Don't you love when I say, does that make sense to 260 people? Like you're all just going to say, yes, it does. Cool, moving on. <laughs> all right, so I'm sketching the, and if it feels like I'm going fast just with sketching the objects, that's where you can go back and check out the previous classes on getting started with the drawing, I'll, you know, do that, that part of the process a lot slower there, but always put these little imperfections. So I grabbed this leaf and I loved how it had all these little moments of imperfections and dots happening on it. But other than uh, those shapes that jump right out at me, there's a lot of variation in dark to light of the, the rest of the, the surface of the leaf. So there's this big shape of a shadow that I'm seeing like this, that kind of feels like a baseball glove maybe, or maybe like a bouquet of flowers. That's what I'm seeing that, that shape of that larger shadow is. And then there's some highlights that I wanna make sure I block off right here. And then there's these little veins and if I, I know I said it in the last class about these alternative shading techniques, but the whole purpose in practicing drawing a still life item using just one of the shading techniques at a time is just to force your brain to apply that shading technique, you know, in places where you maybe would just, you know, shade it in with tonal shading. But once, you know, you've got a handle on all of them, definitely combine them and use multiple ones. I actually got a little impatient with my orchid drawing here. Um, or sorry, that's a, a lily. But I uh, used tonal shading. I cheated, y'all. I totally put some tonal shading for those lighter values there because I was just like, I'd spent a lot of time on that one. Okay, so now that I've got my main values blocked off on this leaf, I'm going to go kind of fast as I fill in this scribbling here. So if you blink, you might miss it. But I'm going to quickly scribble in my medium value that I'm seeing on that, that large shape. And I'm holding my pencil towards the back of my pencil while I do this because I can easily move around the form that way. And I'm going to let it be really loose and messy because this is honestly just my jam and the way that I like to, to draw a lot is to just like fill in really fast and loose. 
And so you'll probably discover really quickly if you are a, if you've got the patience for stippling or if you prefer the uh, quick and loose application of, of scribbling. Okay, now I'm gonna redefine some of these edges because it does have a really sharp edge there. And then for these dark, I'm kind of working my way from like backwards forward. So these little dots on here feel like they're on top of the, the medium value of most of the, the leaf. So that's why I did that first. And then now I'm gonna scribble inside of those little dots. And it's gonna end up looking like tonal shading, like I said, but you know that you applied it using these shading techniques and it definitely has a certain quality from, from using these versus if you had, you know, just filled them in like you were coloring or something. Um, I mean, yeah, they all just have a unique quality. Okay, and then for my lighter values, I'll do that same sort of thing, but just with an H pencil and less pressure on the pencil. So it's a very quick, loose way to draw, and I really love it. I'm curious to hear what which one of the shading techniques so far out of hatching, cross hatching, stippling and scribbling, which ones you guys like best. And I'd love to see some of your drawing examples uh, so far, if anybody has any that they want to hold up and, and share. Oh, I didn't put the shadow in this one. So for the shadow, I'm just gonna draw that blobby shape that I'm seeing for the shadow, and then I'm just gonna fill that in with my scribbles and then try to blend that so I get it one to feel like it's all connected so that the shadow kind of imitates the, the surface. So I did the same value, you know, of stippling there and it definitely took a lot more time. This one fills in a lot faster but I want it to all be even and continuous when I'm done. So it will kind of resemble the tonal shading when you're done if you, if you blend it out like that, but applying it with the scribbling definitely does something and it speeds it up. Um, somebody said they like scribbling because of the texture. I agree. Yeah, it definitely gives it, and it gives it just a nice loose kind of quick, like when you, I think beginning artists, when they're first starting out sketching, um, well, or even more advanced students, sometimes I'll get students in a class who are really tight with their, uh, their skills and they want to just loosen up. So doing drawings with scribbling only is a great way to loosen up. Um, and if you're having trouble even making your scribbles loose, practice just doing some scribble eights, holding your pencil towards the, the back of the pencil like that, because that'll just, you know, loosen your, your hand up and make your muscle movements loose. Um, Adrian, we have a question about um, the, the sheet with the reference um, flowers. Will that oh. be available on any of your social media to reference later? Um, I can, oh, just this one? Yes, like that one. Itself. Um, yeah, I can put it up on um on instagram how about i'll do something and if you're following me on instagram i can put it in my stories tonight and then i can make a little highlight of the stories to pin it to the top there that would probably work let me um your instagram link yeah. to your instagram in there for okay, everybody yeah. make sure before um i leave the studio tonight i take some photos of that and i'll, I'll put it up uh, there in my Instagram stories and then I'll pin it to the top so it's easy to find in my highlights. Um, and uh, yeah, the, um, I totally forgot what I was about to say. Somebody said the stippling takes too long. I mean, it definitely can um, take a long time, but it takes patience. So you guys just got to reframe your, your wording there. It takes too long or it takes patience. 
Um, and yeah, a lot of people are, are impatient, but a friend of mine gave me the line recently, and I really like it, that patience is not something you are or are not. It's something you practice. So um, I think my, my boyfriend's in the class now. He'll appreciate that. <laughs> So I said that to him the other day. Yeah, the class on clouds is all on my, um, it's an independent class that I'm teaching on my own out of my studio by myself, not affiliated with Michael's, but um, you're welcome to sign up for that. You can find the link in the, the link tree. So if, Jimena, do you wanna drop that link again for my link tree and I'll repeat those upcoming classes I have. So it's sure. uh, mind mindfulness with ink is one of the independent classes and then drawing and painting clouds, they're both, three hour workshops. And then uh, the two I have with the Doherty Art Center are intuitive collage and nostalgia for now, which is a watercolor still life class. So those will be both on my link tree, the Doherty Art Center classes, and then my independent classes. Um, and the Doherty classes are on Thursday uh, next week and the following Thursday the two independent workshops I've got planned for the weekend of September 11th and 12th. Um, I'd like to see some of y'all's drawings before we say uh, goodbye. Uh, can we spotlight some folks who want to hold sure. up their stippling, so, stippling sure examples? James. Ooh, very nice. And nice. then I cannot pronounce this, but. <laughs> oh, look at that. Are. Those are really popping off the page there. Yeah, pushing those, those really dark uh, shadows really creates that strong contrast. That's lovely. So we have Barbara as well. Very nice. Yeah, again, having those really dark moments really makes that pop. And then um, Jita. Oh, nice. Oh, you drew my examples. Oh, cool. That's a good idea. I was like, wait, that's my leaf. <laughs> And then, sorry about that. We have Isabella as well. Oh, nice. She did the same thing. It's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. feel free to, to do that in any future classes if you didn't grab a still life item. Um, Audio. Very nice. Although if you have your still life item in front of you, it might be easier to see all the variation in dark and light. Those yeah. are lovely. Really nice scribbling. Well, thank you guys all for joining me. And um, yeah, I'll definitely put the link to the Sunday class up on my Instagram or just keep checking the um, Michael's website for that. It should be up there pretty soon. Um, and th that class um, is on implied lines. So we'll be talking about how to get even more loose, sketchy lines to happen with your, your initial drawings. Perfect. And um, I didn't get a response about the future, uh, the upcoming classes, but um, everyone just, you know, if you continually check, they will be posted. And mm -hmm. also, if you follow um, Adrian on her social media, she will be announcing them as well. All right. Thank everyone so much. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Have a good thank night. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thanks for another amazing class, Adrian. Thank you, Jimena. Again right. soon. Good night. Bye.